recording, if you hear me. Yes, now we are recording. Okay, welcome everyone. Thank you for attending the, the very last session of the conference. Uh, so each paper will be, as usual, 10 minutes, uh, where we will have time for questions after each presentation. You can ask questions either by raising your hand uh, in the app, and then we will unmute you and you will have a chance to, to speak, or you can use the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. So with this, uh, we can start. Uh, and the first talk will be given by Kai Wan Lai. So please uh, start. Okay. okay. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. I'm Kai Yuan Lai. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about the swinger tree in near linear time, which is a joint work with Xue Yi Lü, my advisor, and Miguel Torop. And the swinger tree problem is that given a simple graph G and three vertices of G output a yes no answer to whether G contains an induced subgraph that is a tree that contains the three specified vertices or terminals. Uh, we may assume without loss of generality that the terminals are the leaves of G. The previous work is that Shanovsky and Seymour gave the first and previously only known polynomial time algorithm that runs in mn squared time. And they use a realization of graphs that does not contain such a tree. And they use a classic decomposition method. Our contribution is that we give a new stronger realization for graph that does not contain a three-year tree. And as a byproduct, we give a self-contained shorter proof for their original correlation. Also, we give a near linear time algorithm for the three-year tree problem. And faster algorithms for recognizing the perfect graphs and several other type of detecting induced subgraphs. For example, as the table shown here, we improve the algorithm for detecting the pyramids the thetas and the beetles, and also the detection of odd holes and even holes. Uh, all of the problem here uses the three-year tree problem as a subroutine, but they also contains many non-trivial bottlenecks. In particular, detecting odd holes has been an open problem for decades, and one of these bottlenecks is the three-year tree, and we improve the algorithm to m squared and to the four time. And the perfect graph is a graph such that every induced subgraph edge of G satisfies that the chromatic number equals the size of maximal clique. And the famous strong perfect graph theorem says that G is perfect if and only if neither G nor the complement of G contains an odd hole. Therefore, an algorithm for the odd hole is trivially an algorithm for the perfect graph. The Shonovsky and Seymour's original correlation is that G does not contain a three-year tree if and only if it admits a they call local net decomposition. Let X be a subset of VG. Uh, a graph H is called an X net if each member of VH and EH represents a subset of X. And with certain con connectivity conditions, then we will call that a XNet, and we will omit the definition here. And our stronger realization is that G does not contain three-year tree if and only if G admits a web decomposition with a local adding net, where a web is just an XNet that allows parallel arc and with extra structural condition within each arc. And the unique adding net is, is a net that describes the bare bone structure of the web. So for example, if the web looks like this, then the unique aiding net will look like this. And in our algorithm, we will first find a base X web that looks like this and compute its aiding net. 
Then in each iteration, we will find a candidate path outside of X. Then we will try to extend the web structure like this. Or in some case, we fail to do so, and we are ensure that there is a swing tree here. So we will repeat the process until there's no such candidate exists and output that you has no swing tree. The intuition is that we first, with our nuclearization, we can bound the number of iterations by n. So that's the first improvement. And another new figure on factor was removed by dynamic data structures like SPQR trees and top trees. And it would be nice to know a true linear time algorithm. And we mark that the phone your tree is still open. So thanks for listening. And any questions? Thank you, Taiwan. Uh, we have time for, for a couple of questions for sure. Maybe I can start with a question. So if you could please go to, to one of your first slides where you were showing the, the, those different graphs uh, for which uh, contain, containment was uh, previously studied. Um, right. One. So out of those, like, which one do you consider the most important? Uh, the most important might probably be the ad hoc uh, because the perfect graph is partly based on the ad hoc. And the actually the pyramid was a subroutine used in the detection of ad hoc. And the thetas here is a is a subroutine in detecting the even holes. Yeah. Also the betas is for even holes. Well the dotted lines represents a path of positive legs. Okay, thank you. Let me check whether there are any more questions or participants raising hands. I don't see any more questions, so I think we can we can finish here. So thank you, I'll, I'll clap. Thank you for your talk. Thanks. Uh, and now we switch to Jesper, who will talk about counting patterns in sub-exponential time. So Jesper, please share your slides. OK. Uh, I hope you can hear me. Yeah. Um, we can hear you. OK. So um, yeah, this paper is about pattern occurrences in plane graphs. Um, so let P be a, a pattern graph on K vertices and G a host graph on N vertices. Then a pattern occurrence is just a mapping of the vertices from, uh, of P to the vertices of G, uh, like here's an example. And the mapping is supposed to witness that P occurs as a subgraph of G. And the computational problem uh, um, that uh, I address in this paper is uh, given uh, P and G counts all the pattern occurrences. Or there's also induced pattern occurrences where the witness should witness that P occurs as an induced subgraph of G. Yeah, that's an uh, NP-hard problem, unfortunately. So we expect to get some exponential running time. Uh, so what we do is we assume that this uh, K is a lot smaller than N. And then we aim for a running time to type F of K times poly N. In this f of k, we try to make as small as possible in the start. So it will be exponential, but still maybe we can make it uh, as small as exponential. So there has been, a, has been quite some work on this. Um, so one uh, that was observed by many, I believe, uh, like if the pattern happens to be an unrecorded path or independent set, then there is a deterministic uh, algorithm um, that detects such a pattern occurrence in time two to the square root of k. Uh, in 2010, Doran gave a uh, deterministic counting algorithm that counts all the patterns in 2 to the k. So I'm omitting factors that are poorly n here, since I'm not focusing on that. Uh, and then in 2016, uh, Botlander, uh, myself, and Van der Zander, uh, we gave also a deterministic counting algorithm. 
and we came with this funky running time due to the n over log n and somewhat surprisingly it turned out that this was the uh, the right running time so if you want to improve the running time you should review the exponential time hypothesis so somehow you could say probably this is the, the best one or there's some very good boundary to, uh, towards improvements barrier towards improvements uh, then Fomin et al, um, they gave a lot of patterns where actually there was this two to the square root k kind of running time. Uh, so before this was only known for a restricted set of patterns and they managed to extend the set a bit. But unfortunately their algorithms were uh, randomized and they also didn't extend to the counting setting. And if you combine these two last works, you also get an algorithm for general uh, connected patterns uh, in running time two to the k over log k, but it's also um, uh, randomized and doesn't work for the counting setting. So that left some open questions like, yeah, what can we do for general patterns? Can we get two to the k over log k for general patterns? Or oh, is this connect uh, connectivity a necessary requirement? Uh, can we de-randomize? Can we extend to the counting setting? And in this work, uh, yeah, we resolve all these things in the affirmative. Um, so for general patterns, indeed, uh, we get this two to the k over log k running time. Um, and also for these uh, natural cases, we get this uh, desire to, to the k, uh, to the square root k times poly log k uh, running time. Um, so the nice nice thing about this is that uh, these running times are now optimal optimal under the ETH. Even these these two to the square root k running times are uh, most of them are optimal under the, the exponential time hypothesis. Um, so we get running times for the detect uh, detection variant that is uh, optimal in the exponential time hypothesis. And in the meanwhile, we also de-randomize the, these previous results and we get running times that are equally fast for even the counting version. So before this work, there was no um, sub-exponential parameterized algorithm for, uh, for the counting version, like counting independent sets in some uh, sub, uh, uh, sub graphs of grids or so. Uh, so now also all these counting algorithms are equally, fa equally fast as the detection. Okay, and then uh, in the last slide, I want to say a bit of, about the approach. Uh, so it, that will be very vague, but uh, that's a bit too much to say here. Um, so if you're only interested in detecting, uh, detecting patterns quickly, then you only need one of the two techniques that's uh, in the paper. And this I called uh, sparsifying uh, balanced cycle separators, I think in the paper, sparsifying balanced separators. Uh, and what it does, it finds a family of uh, smallish balanced separators that have limited pairwise overlap. Um, yeah, okay, if you want to see more uh, uh, precise statements, please look at the, the full version of the talk. Um, and the, the proof ingredients there for the people that know these terms, uh, it, yeah, Baker's technique is involved, some adjusted proof of the planar grid minor theorem, and uh, a nice generalization of Mengen's theorem by uh, the previous work that I mentioned by Fomin et al. And this, uh, this technique is used, uh, so uh, because we have this family of balanced separators and we only have k verts in the pattern occurrence, we can argue that there must be one separator that only has few verts of this uh, pattern occurrence um, because these uh, separators are pairs disjoint. And this separator we can somehow use to decompose the problem into subproblems. Uh, even that's a bit complicated, so we need this, uh, some other technique by uh, the paper by Bodle on it all. And if you're only interested, uh, or if you're additionally interested, I should say, in actually counting these patterns quickly, you need another method, which I call efficient inclusion-exclusion. So even the Baker's technique is not easy to extend it to a counting version. Um, and, and actually here we show how to do that uh, as well. And uh, yeah, the idea is to first set up an inclusion-exclusion formula that does the exact count. But unfortunately, it turns out that that has uh, as many as two to the k cements. K was the number first of the pattern. Uh, but it turns out that somehow we can shrink this uh, to an inclusion-exclusion formula that only uses uh, k-square cements because these cements in this inclusion-exclusion formula, they are really uh, uh, dependent on each other in some way. That's all I had. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, Jesper. Uh, so I wanted to ask, uh, do you know what happens beyond planar graphs? Like, uh, are there stronger lower bounds or do you expect that some of the results might be transferred there as well? So to be honest, I have no idea. Um, so the, the methods that, uh, especially this first new technique, I don't think it easily uh, um, applies uh, if you go beyond uh, planarity, maybe bounded genius, maybe things work. Uh, also, I, I should say I haven't thought that much about it. My focus was on the plain case. 
um, yeah, so the, the fair answer is I, I do not know how easy that will be. Might be very hard, maybe not. Okay. But you, I, you need at least some ideas, I think. It's, it's, it's not going to extend to learning. Yeah. Let me check whether other participants have any questions. It doesn't seem to be the case. So with this, uh, oh, thank you, Jesper. I'll clap for you. Thank you. Uh, and now we'll move to the to the third speaker, which is Berle Havi. Can you can you please share your slides? Uh, yes. Let me show screen. Okay. Please start. Um, okay. So thank you for listening. I will talk about an exponential time algorithm for the planar disjoint paths problem. So just a brief uh, introduction. So in parameterized complexity, we deal with parameterized problems, which means that every instance of the problem is associated with some parameter, for example, the size of the output or some structural parameter uh, that uh, is related to the structure of the input. And one of the main goals is to design fixed parameter tractable algorithms. Uh, so, so it means that we want algorithms whose running time is of the form f of k times some polynomial in the input size. This is denoted by O star of f of k. We hide the polynomial in the input size factor. And this, is a, this can be substantially better than getting running time of the form n choose k, uh, in particular when the parameter k is small compared to the input size. So in particular, notice that it means that we confine the combinatorial explosion just to the parameter k rather than the entire input size. So the graph minus project of Robertson and Simo was actually the inspiration behind the birth of parameterized analysis. There is a major issue in terms of efficiency. In particular, there is an immense parameter dependence of the algorithms that are based on this theory and they even got their own names. They are called galactic algorithms. And I also put here a funny quote that says that if you have an instance that you can fit into the universe, then you would prefer the number of vertices to the 70, even to a constant, if it was a constant that, uh, is the, that you get from uh, the, uh, this project. Uh, so what is the situation in particular for the disjoint paths uh, problem on general graphs? So this is also one of the consequences of the graph minors project, and it is very related and relevant to it. Um, so uh, we have uh, on general graphs galactic algorithm. So it means that the dependency on K is very bad. Uh, for planar graphs, the situation is better. So uh, on one hand, we have galactic algorithms uh, with linear dependence on the number of vertices uh, of the graph. Uh, but we also have non-galactic algorithms still with uh, quite a uh, bad dependence on the parameter. So here we have double exponential dependence on k uh, times uh, n to the power of two. Um, so one of our main, main goals is to build an efficient graph minor theory. So more, a more uh, a precise goal perhaps is to get uh, algorithms with running time two to the polynomial in k uh, for minor containment, disjoint paths, and topological minor containment. So just to make sure that uh, uh, you didn't miss it, uh, so by K, so in particular for disjoint paths, this is the number of terminal pairs that we have uh, in the input. Okay, so we have K terminal pairs, and we want to connect them with the uh, vertex disjoint paths. So why do we care about this particular problem? So I will not define minor containment and topological minor containment also here, but I will only, also only say that uh, the algorithms, uh, these algorithms are based on the entire graph minors uh, theory. And if we make them uh, efficient, then we, we need to make uh, the entire graph minors theory or at least large parts of it also efficient. So now uh, let me uh, just uh, briefly mention the scheme that was used for all of these three problems uh, before our work. So it is based on the case distinction in, so into three cases. So if the tree width of the input graph is small, 
Then we can do dynamic programming. If the tree width is uh, say W, then we can uh, solve the problem in time to the order W log W N, uh, even on general graphs. And this is optimal in the sense that we cannot improve, uh, we cannot improve on the dependency on W. Even for planar graphs under the ETH, we cannot get to, to the little O of W times some polynomial in the input size. Okay, now if the tree width is not small, then we have the two following cases. First, we deal with the case where we have a large click minor, and then there are arguments how we can find any relevant vertex in the click based on some routing arguments. Here by relevant vertex, it means that we can remove this uh, vertex and the answer to the problem uh, doesn't change. We had a collection of disjoint paths that, co that connect the terminal pair pairs before, if and only if we have it now after we removed this uh, vertex. Now in the third case, when the tree width is large, we're not in the first case, and also we don't have a large click minor, uh, then we use the following. Uh, so um, uh, first uh, we use the flat uh, wall theorem to say that G contains a large piece, which is almost planar, and there is some vertex, say V, which is sufficiently insulated in its middle. Then but, uh, we use another theorem to say that this vertex V is actually relevant. We can remove it and the answer doesn't change. Okay, so for planar graph, uh, we can uh, use this if we have three with roughly two to the power of k. So if we have three with roughly two to the power of k, then we can use this and find any relevant vertex. And then we remove it and proceed. And this turns us to all also be optimal for planar graphs. Uh, so uh, by this I mean that uh, three with roughly two to the k is actually required. There are some graphs that have roughly two to k many vertices and where every vertex is relevant, you cannot remove anything. So um, let me say uh, something more about this scheme. So one thing that I uh, want to highlight first is that solving the problems on almost planar graphs, planar graphs is actually a critical component in order to solve this problem on general graphs, okay? So if you want to solve the problem of general graphs, it's good to have some procedure that uh, handles uh, almost planar graphs. This can be used as a procedure when we deal with the general case. Now, the second thing that I want to say is this, this approach cannot get, give us two to the poly k times some polynomial in the input size, even for uh, planar graphs. Uh, so the second case where we have a large click minor, this is not relevant for uh, planar graphs. We don't have a large click minor there, but, um, but look at the, the, the first and third case. So in the third case, you can see that we cannot make the tree uh, smaller than roughly two to the k, at least with this uh, idea of removing uh, irrelevant vertices. And then on the other hand, uh, this means that when we are in the first case, we will get here two to the two to the k under the ETH. We cannot do better. Okay, we have two to the power of uh, three with, so we have two to the two to the k. So this gives us double exponential. So what we show uh, in this uh, work is how to get an algorithm with running time two to the poly k, even two to the order of k squared times some polynomial in the input uh, size uh, for the planar disjoint paths problem. And for this, we had to uh, substantiate, we had to do something else rather than just uh, following this scheme. And uh, we use a different approach, which is based on a algebraic flow, homotopy, tree reduction, and structural graph theory. Um, so I don't really have time to say anything more about what we did. For this, you can either see the um, uh, full uh, talk or you can look at the paper. Uh, but uh, at least uh, I would like to say that uh, one thing in the paper is this is the first time that we used reef reduction uh, to design parameterized algorithms in in way that is not just uh, using dynamic uh, programming afterwards. Okay, so thank you for listening. I can take questions now. Uh, thank you, Nera. Let me check whether there are questions. I don't see any questions. Can you please remind me what, what is known on the lower bound side? 
Um, so we don't know, I mean, maybe we can get, uh, say, two to the order K. There is not much that is not known uh, for um, lower bounds. Yeah. I mean, I, I, there is the lower bound uh, when the parameter is trivial, which I uh, said uh, earlier. But when the parameter is K, I don't know. Let me repeat it whether there are any questions. So I remind participants that they can ask questions either by raising their hand and then I'll allow to, allow to talk, uh, or you can use the Q&A button at the bottom. Okay, there are no questions. So thank you, Mayra, for, for you. Uh, and now we are moving to the very last uh, speaker, which is Daniel Lokstanov. So Daniel, please share your slides. Uh, can you guys hear me? Yes, we can hear you. I don't see the slides too. Not yet. Or not yet. Okay, good. Or not good. Let's see. Uh, there we go. How about now? Yes, now we can see. You can start. Okay. So uh, I'll be talking about the paper Hitting Topological Miners is Fixed Parameter Tractable, uh, which is joint work with Fedor, Fahad, Saket, and Meirav, who gave the previous talk. So uh, what are miners and topological miners? Well, a graph H is a miner of a graph G. If you can obtain H from G, by deleting vertices, deleting edges, or contracting edges. So, so if you have a graph G and you want to know what are the minors or topological minors of it, you can start by copying it. And then you can delete vertices or delete edges. So, so here we will be deleting vertex, here we delete an edge. And here we contract an edge incident to the degree two vertex on the bottom right. So a graph H is a topological minor of G if all of the contracted edges are incident to degree two vertex at the time that you contracted them. So the, the graph that we see now on the bottom right, in fact, each of the intermediate ones that we saw were topological minors of the graph G and also minors of it. Now, uh, if I do the contraction of the left edge, then that's something that I'm not allowed to do, in, or I'm allowed to do it for minors, but not for topological minors. So the graph on the right is not a topological minor of G. Well, actually it is, uh, because we could have done the, a different set of operations and obtained the same graph. If you look at the, gra if you look at, um, the graph on the right, it's just a path uh, on four vertices and the vertex that sees all four of them. And we can obtain that by deleting these two vertices and contracting now this edge or contracting an edge that's incident to degree two vertex. And now you'll see that um, you have, again, a path on four vertices uh, and one vertex that sees all of them. So, so I guess uh, this should already give you some idea that if I give you a graph G and, and a graph H, uh, it's not always easy to know right away whether H is a minor of G or whether H is a topological minor of G, uh, which is what this work is about. So, so we're, we're, we have three key players. Uh, and by key players, I mean the problems uh, that, that are all interconnected and, and we'll be talking about. So the first one is the disjoint pass problem, which Meirav spoke about in the previous talk. So input is G and K vertex pairs, S1, T1, S2, T2, and so on. Uh, and we ask, uh, can we find K paths that don't share any vertices where the ith path connects the ith terminal pair? So PI connects SI with TI. Uh, notice this is different from ST flow because in, like, if in just ST, vert in ST flow, uh, you can connect the first vertex of S with the fifth vertex of T. Uh, whereas here you need to connect the first vertex of S with the first vertex of T and so on. 
Then, of course, the topological minor question, which we uh, discussed on the previous slide. So I give you as input the graph G and the graph H, and I ask, is H a topological minor of G? And finally, uh, we have the problem which we're considering in this paper, which is topological minor hitting, uh, which goes like this. If I give you a graph G and a few, uh, and a list of a few graphs, H1 through HT, and an integer K, and I ask you, does there exist a set on at most k vertices, so that for all i, h i is not a topological minor of g. So, so this might seem like a strange problem. Uh, one good reason to define a problem like this is that it generalizes a bunch of other well-studied problems. So, so for example, if I just have two graphs, h1 and h2, the k5 on the click on five vertices, or, and the k33, so the complete bipartite graph with three vertices on both sides, then Kuratovsky's theorem says that a graph is planar if and only if it excludes k5 and k33 as topological minors. So topological minor hitting for h1 equals to k5 and h2 equals to k33 now corresponds to deleting the fewest possible vertices to make the graph planar. Um, and in addition to planar graphs, we could have put a lot of other uh, problems that are defined by forbidden topological minors. For example, deleting two acyclic graphs means forbidding a triangle as a topological minor uh, is now topological minor hitting with H1 being a triangle. So what's known about these three problems? They're, they're all NP-complete, so, so we don't expect to have any algorithms that run in polynomial time for them. Uh, on the other hand, uh, their parameterized complexity have been studied quite extensively. So this joint paths was shown to have a cubic time algorithm for every fixed K with like a terrible dependence F uh, all the way back in 1995. In fact, this is when the paper was published, but the announcement of the algorithm came probably about 10 years before that. Uh, so, so this is an algorithm that's very famous and has been around for, for, for a really long time. Uh, in fact, if you think about it, even getting an N to the K kind of algorithm here is really, really non-trivial. Uh, as far as I know, uh, the algorithm of Robertson and Seymour was the first algorithm that was polynomial for every fixed value of k. And then it sort of coincidentally happened to be FPT as well, so f of k times m cubed. Uh, for the topological minor question, the disjoint paths algorithm immediately implies, um, immediately implies an algorithm with running time f of h n to the h plus 3, where h is the number of vertices in the graph h. So, so if you think of h as a small pattern, like in, in Jesper's talks previously, and you're asking, does the big graph g on n vertices contain the small graph h as a pattern, but now as a topological subgraph rather than as a subgraph? Um, this is not, again, not even obvious how to do in time n to the power h, uh, because you have to guess where uh, these paths, degree two vertices that you contract, will, will correspond to long paths uh, in, in your graph. And you cannot just guess exactly their location. But what you can do is that you can guess uh, the positions, the h positions where these paths meet, and then run the disjoint paths algorithm of Robertson and Seymour uh, to figure out whether g contains h as a topological minor. Now, now, with this, it was of course a natural open problem whether you can get h out of the exponent. And in 2010, uh, Grohe, Kavarabayashi, Marx, and Wallon now gave an algorithm with running time f of h n cubed. Now that you have an algorithm with running time f of h n cubed for topological minor, that of course automatically implies an algorithm with running time n to the k for the topological minor hitting problem. So you can just try all subsets of size k, remove them, and then check whether the remaining graph uh, doesn't contain any of the graphs h1 through ht as a topological minor. So in light of their algorithm, it becomes a very natural open problem uh, whether you can get the k out of the exponent, uh, which, which is precisely what we do. So, so this is our result, um, that there exists an algorithm for topological minor hitting with running time, some function of h and k times n to the 4. So uh, a few words about 
uh, the main technique uh, in our paper. It's it's a cute comp so, so it's it's a cute combination of three uh, three well known techniques, namely the irrelevant vertex rail, which Mayra talked about, is the central piece um, of the graph miners theory. Really, uh, there's uh, important separators where uh, there are these nice bounds on that there's only that many ways to cut up a graph in the best possible way. Um, and then there is branching algorithms from parameter algorithms, which are widely used. And I'm not going to say too much other than uh, we combine all of them uh, and then we get our theorem, uh, but we also have to combine a lot of pain. So, so really what's, what's going on is that there is a very nice clean way of combining these three things uh, to get our theorem but it doesn't quite work out and in terms of in a, and in basically in order to make it work out we have to reprove uh, a strengthening of the Grohe et al paper uh, which then uh, involves a lot of technical work so i think that's all i'm going to say about that uh, thank you thank you daniel so, so the comment for for your just previous slide so since you have to reprove the the paper by Grohe et al uh, like when you focus just on this by using your ideas, can you somehow simplify the paper? Uh, not really. So, so, so actually, what was what's going on is that um, their paper has so, so 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 their paper follows like a funny recursive structure, and and, and again, the, the the hard part is for them to prove that in the middle of a flat wall, there is an irrelevant vertex. And you would think that from the way they prove it, it should be really easy to adapt it to what we need, which is the following. Suppose you have a large wall that is not just this large, it's super large. It's like super large even compared to this large, yes? Then inside this flat wall, you can find an irrelevant flat wall, uh, which also, which where the largeness of the irrelevant wall grows with the largeness of the original wall. I mean, like, intuitively, what, what, what happens is that if you have a large flat wall, the middle of it is irrelevant, and if you have a much, much bigger wall, then the entire interior is, is irrelevant at the same time. But, but that doesn't seem to follow, at least directly, from what they, from, from what, from what they prove. Uh, and that is what we have to reprove. And then uh, there, there, there's a lot of, like, technical combinatorial arguments that go into that. Uh, and then from that, once we did that, we were like, well, this puts us so close to reproving their algorithm that we can put in the easy parts of their algorithm as well uh, and, and, and have a complete standalone additional proof of, uh, of, of topological minor containment. Understood. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, let me check whether there are any questions. I don't see any questions. So thank you, Daniel, and thanks to all the speakers of the session. Uh, also, uh, since this is the last session of the conference, I'd like to uh, thank the organizers and uh, Yulia as a PC chair, who had really a lot of work. Uh, I can certify this. Uh, I, uh, I was receiving emails from Yulia almost every day for a month uh, or even two. Uh, so thanks, Yulia, for all your work. And also I'd like to remind that there is uh, the app, the gather town which is a virtual hallway that we can still join after this session so thank you everyone uh yeah and i invite you to to the virtual hallway thank you